Welcome to CB8 Speaks. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez, a public member of Manhattan Community Board 8. This is an evening, a, weekly, a monthly program of issues related to Community Board 8 in Manhattan, which is the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. The Upper East Side being defined by East 59th Street to East 96th Street, the East River to the East Side of Fifth Avenue. Community boards are representative, uh, local representative bodies with 50 volunteers appointed by the borough president in consultation with city council members who represent the district. Manhattan has 12 community boards out of 59 boards in all of New York City, and we uh, on the board play an advisory role to government in zoning, land use issues, community planning, city budget process, and the coordination of municipal services. If you want to learn more about community boards, please visit our website, which is cb8m.com. Or you can also visit the Borough President's um, website at mbpo.org. We have a picture of our website up on the screen right now, and it shows the calendar. Anyone who has a significant interest in Community Board 8, such as a resident or a business, we encourage you to come to the board meetings and also the committee meetings, which were also shown on the calendar. These um, uh, meetings help formulate opinions for the full board meetings, which are once a month. You can seek appointment to the community board, um, and as I mentioned, be appointed by the borough president, and you can apply via the community um, borough president's website, mbpo.org. Our guest tonight is state, New York State Senator Jose M. Serrano. He represents the 28th Senate District and has represented since 2005. Senator Serrano's district is very, very unique, covering five community boards, including Manhattan Community District 8, neighborhoods of Roosevelt Island and Yorkville, not all of Community District 8, but just those areas. But he also covers um, Community District 8's neighborhood of East Harlem, Bronx Community District 1's neighborhoods of Melrose and Mott Haven, Bronx Community District 4 neighborhood of Highbridge and West Concourse, and Bronx Community District 5's neighborhood of Morris Heights and University Heights. Um, Senator Serrano um, uh, has a lot of responsibilities in Albany. He serves as the chair of the Cultural Affairs, Tourism, Parks, and Recreation. And he also serves in the committees for aging, crime victims, crime and correction, education, elections, environmental conservation, higher education, and the Rules Committee. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to be here, Monica. Thank you. Uh, we like to get started talking about how you get involved, how our guests get involved in public office. Now, what led you to seek public office? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I ask myself that question a lot, but it, it really, I think, stems from a, a number of different factors. Um, uh, first and foremost, my dad is uh, uh, in elected office. He's a member of Congress, and I grew up uh, watching him and uh, really admiring the way that, that he did his work. He represents the Bronx. Um, but, but to be quite honest, growing up in my teen years uh, and definitely in my 20s, I, I thought the last thing that I would do would be to run for office. And at the time, I, after college, I worked in theater. I worked in the New York Shakespeare Festival, and uh, it, I was having a great time there. But as I um, grew older, and I became more involved in community issues, and I started asking questions about what was going on. And I became a member of Community Board 4 uh, in the Bronx, and I started learning a lot about the land use process and a lot of the other committees that are a part of uh, the Community Board. Um, and I felt that there was, um, there was need for change and that there was need for um, new elected officials to throw their ha hat in the ring. So I ran for the New York City Council in 2001 and was the only uh, person in the city of New York to defeat an incumbent that year. Uh, I served in the city council for three years and then ran against 26-year uh, incumbent Olga Mendez uh, for the 28th Senate District and, and, and won that race and, and been here ever since. And it, it really is um, uh, a joy uh, to work on issues that I find uh, very important, especially in the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, was also in the city council, and as I mentioned earlier, my background is in is in theater, uh, so it, it's um, it really is so wonderful to to try to uh, do something to to help expand the arts, uh, not only on a city level but on a state level. How long have you been handling the committee for cultural affairs? 
I, uh, upon getting elected to uh, the state Senate and sworn in in January in 2005, the Democrats at that time in the Senate were in the minority. Um, but I became the ranking member, the ranking Democrat on uh, what was then called the Tourism Committee. Um, in uh, last year, um, the Democrats, uh, there was a shift in power and the Democrats became the majority and uh, uh, the committee, I became the chairman of the committee and the first thing that I did was to change the name of the committee from the Tourism and Sports Recreation Committee to Cultural Affairs uh, Parks, uh, Tourism and Parks. Um, why did I do that? Because I felt that it was important that cultural organizations, not just in New York City, but on the state level, feel that there was a vehicle for them on the state level for, to have their concerns heard. Uh, that there was a committee for them uh, that would allow them to uh, push for budgetary items, to be able to talk about the economic engine that the arts are uh, on a state level, and also the educational opportunities that it provides for people. And it was an area that really there was not a lot of attention paid to it unfortunately by the elected officials um, so you know at first there was a lot of my colleagues who uh, wondered okay Serrano why you know why the arts why mm -hmm. is this so important but as I explained to them that not only are the arts an economic driver for New York City and for the rest of the state but the educational opportunities that they provide uh, for students is just uh, amazing and we're missing an opportunity we should be doing better that's a really important point, and um, that's for an average New Yorker, you know, the theater is so important. We walk around um, in the community district eight area, we see film productions going on, and we know how important it is. Um, uh, how do you interact with other uh, elected officials in the CB8 area um, on issues? Well, you know, I, as we started off, I, I probably have geographically one of the most unique Senate districts, the 28th Senate district. Uh, encompasses uh, um, sort of three very distinct geographic areas separated by water. Mm -hmm. You have Roosevelt Island, uh, you have East Harlem, Yorkville, and you have the South Bronx where I live. I live near Yankee Stadium. We have all of that and Highbridge and University Heights. So I think uh, socially, uh, economically, it's probably the most diverse district um, in, in the state of New York. But I'm very fortunate to have such a wonderful working relationship with the elected officials uh, on the east side. Uh, first and foremost, my mentor is Liz Kruger, and I say that to her all the time. Uh, she's the one who uh, encouraged me uh, to, to run for the Senate out of mm -hmm. the City Council, um, and she is one of the most courageous people I've ever met in my life, and she has taught me a great deal, and she's the type of senator that I aspire to be. So Liz is uh, someone who I, I work very closely with, and as well as Assemblymember Jonathan Bang, Councilmember Jessica Lappin, and Dan Gorodnik, um, and uh, uh, Micah Kellner. Again, we have some of the hardest working elected officials. And even though Yorkville and Roosevelt Island is only a percentage of my district, it's an extremely important portion because there is so much going on, there's so much diversity, and there's so much need on the state level and the state senate for leadership. But I couldn't do it alone. And thankfully, I've been embraced by a group of elected officials who uh, really care about issues, who really care about integrity, really care about doing the right thing. Um, and I've been able to work with uh, Assemblymember Kellner and Bing on issues uh, to help the businesses along the Second Avenue corridor that are being affected by the construction of the Second Avenue subway. We've done, we're working on legislation now in, up in Albany. Been uh, very happy to work with uh, Councilmember Lappin on the uh, East River Esplanade uh, and uh, with Liz Kruger on a number of issues. Uh, one recently I think we were working on was uh, uh, standing against the uh, Parks Department uh, putting their tennis bubbles in, uh, in Central Park. So various issues um, and it's been a, a total pleasure to work with all of them. Um, you, you mentioned uh, working on the Second Avenue subway. Um, do you get a lot of um, uh, uh, contact with your constituency? Do they come forward with their issues on the Second Avenue subway? Because uh, the the key construction zone is in your district. Right. Yeah. The launch the launch pad for the Second Avenue subway on 96th Street is is in the 28th Senate district, and those businesses along Second Avenue uh, and during that first phase and. Are, are, and they continue to be affected uh, in such a negative way. Mm -hmm. uh, many businesses have closed. They've all lost money. Um, and uh, the business owners, the constituents, have, 
have really let their voices be heard. Um, and thankfully, through the work with the Second Avenue Business Association um, and with the local elected officials, we've crafted uh, two pieces of legislation that I'm sponsoring in, in the Senate. One would provide a uh, tax incentive program, tax break for businesses there that are being negatively uh, 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 affected, as well as a grants program. Uh, unfortunately, those two uh, bills cost money. Uh, mm -hmm. And in a time of economic recession, we've seen a lot of pushback uh, from the governor and from the mayor's office. But again, we, we still keep plugging away because my fear is that if we lose those businesses on Second Avenue, the entire neighborhood will suffer uh, economically. Uh, and we don't want to go back to those days when we didn't have the economic uh, uh, engine that uh, those Second Avenue businesses are providing now. And we definitely have to save them. Another key issue in um, Community District 8, the Upper East Side specifically, is affordable housing. Um, what do you think all, all we can do to help the people in that area? Because um, we have no available land. We just can't go and you know, take you know, some farmland and throw up some new houses. So right. what, what's your perspective on the area? Well, housing? again, I, I refer back to Senator Liz Kruger, who um, is, is really the guru on issues of affordable housing, and she's taught me so much. Um, and um, there, there's actually a, you know, there, there needs to be a multifaceted approach to preserving and maintaining affordability, uh, especially on the east side, because it's such a challenge, like you said, the, there aren't any vacant lots. Um, but how do you do that? Well, first of all, you try to preserve as much Michelama housing as you can, which is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could sit here and, and ask the question, why was Michelama allowed to sunset as it did, and, and uh, why weren't we prepared for the sort of next phase of Michelama? Uh, but unfortunately, it is what it is, and we're trying so hard to try to maintain the units that do exist. The second is, is uh, uh, updating and strengthening our rent regulation laws. Um, I have been a very active and vocal uh, member of the state legislature in calling for the repeal and reform of the vacancy decontrol laws. Uh, right now we are losing a, a vast number of affordable units uh, every month uh, to vacancy decontrol and very soon we will find ourselves uh, in a city where the middle class can no longer afford to live. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes uh, Yorkville is such a wonderful place to live is that you have that mix economically. Um, you have uh, so many working families there, um, and they are there because there was affordability. And we're, we're shortchanging uh, residents of, uh, of CB8 if we were to lose that. On Roosevelt Island, uh, we've uh, sponsored a number of, of programs and have worked with uh, the various state agencies on housing to try to find ways to preserve uh, affordability on the island as well as to uh, preserve um, and maintain the Section 8 vouchers that a lot of the tenants have. It's such a challenge, and there's so many powerful forces that are against uh, affordability. But uh, we need to do all that we can, and my, elect my colleagues on, on the east side, are we're all united to try to preserve that. What do you think of our key environmental issues that um, Community District 8 um, has contend with that the state could uh, assist with? Well, there, you know, the the items and the issues that you're dealing with, that we are dealing with here in CB8, are um, pretty common, I guess, throughout the 28th Senate District. Um, you know, CB8 is not far from East Harlem. It's not far from the South Bronx, and um, we, you know, we've had uh, so many environmental justice issues that have caused this very high asthma rate that we mm -hmm. see in our youth, um, and uh, lack of green space, lack of viable green space. So environmental issues um, are, are extremely important. I have, if you look at my bills um, that I've uh, sponsored in the Senate, many focus on the environment. Recently, I passed a bill in the Senate um, that would call on uh, the uh, Department of Environmental Con uh, Conservation to put forth a listing of environmental high impact zones. Now, why is this important? Because as we look to maintain or create environmental justice in neighborhoods, we have to know which neighborhoods have been bombarded um, and which neighborhoods have been really hurt. And that's why it's important that we know uh, that we have this report come out from DEC so we could see what uh, areas, what neighborhoods within CB8 um, have had to contend with contamination, mm -hmm. would have to contend with brownfields. Um, and I think this will help uh, all of us be a lot more informed uh, so that when there is a polluting facility and when there is other facilities that can do harm to the community, 
that we are we have the knowledge and the uh, the wherewithal to stand against it. There's a, a lot of um, concern in the Upper East Side, in particular, about um, the lack of school space, mm -hmm. and um, and with some schools are breaking ground on, but there's there's a great need for more space in the future. What what is your perspective on um, what's coming, right. and what can be done? Well, school space is uh, classroom space is uh, an issue everywhere in the South Bronx. All mm -hmm. the parts of my district have, are contending with this. Uh, major, major problem, and so, mu so much of it has to do with budget. Um, because uh, the state controls so much of the school education budget, and because we're staring at a $10 billion budget gap, it becomes such a challenge and such a task to come up with the funds needed to build new school space, to, to build viable school space. Um, and again, I think that, that we have to do all that we can to be innovative uh, and to make sure that we update the school space that we have to make sure that it is, it is clean, it is safe, um, and that we give kids the opportunity uh, to do well. Um, we are preparing the next generation to be part of a global economy. Um, it's going to be much different than the world I grew up in or my parents grew up in. Um, and if we're not able to compete on that level, if we're not able to prepare our youth, um, economically we will not be. What New, you know, what New York City has been for so long or what this nation has been for so long. So I think it's important that we remember that there is a very finite window of opportunity to, imp to leave a great impression on our youth. Uh, and having a uh, viable school space, having good classrooms, uh, and having you know, one, of the, one of my pet issues, which is arts education, art and music education, which is always the first to go on the chopping block mm -hmm. uh, whenever there's a, a financial cut, um, we will not be preparing our, our students for the next uh, global economy. What are, um, you mentioned a few of the um, bills that, of yours that you've introduced have been passed. What other uh, legislation you've been recently involved with or that you're looking to push forward? Well, there's a, c a couple of bills that are of critical importance. One of them that I introduced last year was to create a uh, federal stimulus ombudsman. We, you know, there was so much talk about this federal stimulus money that was coming into New York, um, but how are we going to really follow the money? How are we going to know that the money is actually being spent in a way that creates economic activity, that preserves jobs, uh, and that reinforces our infrastructure? Um, and quite frankly, I think if you asked anyone on the street, how has federal stimulus dollars been spent in New York State, they'd probably scratch their head and wonder. Uh, so my bill uh, sought to create an office of the federal stimulus ombudsman, someone who would drill down the data to make sure that every dollar of federal stimulus is being spent in a way that is accountable, that is transparent, and not being wasted. Um, and it's re received a lot of support. And actually, because of the work on my bill, the governor created a quasi uh, office. Uh, not quite everything that I had in my bill, but it's definitely a, a move in the right direction. Another bill that, that I've been working on, along with my colleague in the Assembly, uh, Assembly Member Sandy Galef, is a bill to reform the member item process. Um, for too long, uh, member items have been very problematic. Um, you know, just open the newspapers uh, any day and you'll read about uh, member items that have been misused or misspent or unaccounted for. Uh, the bill that I've introduced will create greater transparency and will remove conflicts of interest. Working with the Attorney General's office, um, there would be a conflict of interest form that every elected official under perjury of law would have to sign. But I think what's even more important about this bill is that it would create a level playing field, that every elected official would get the same amount of member item money. Right now, it's so subjective, um, you know, based on political power. Um, a, 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 and by leadership, and elect, certain elected officials get a lot more member items uh, for their community, and another would get a far less. Now, member item money is grant money. It's money that's given to community organizations in need. Uh, and I think it's unfair, th since we all represent the same amount of uh, constituents, that we should have such a varying degree uh, of dif different numbers of, mm -hmm. uh, of pots. So I believe that. This is something that really needs to happen. I, uh, myself, uh, will not be participating in the member item program uh, until we get some change and some reform. Now, you, your district covers eight, um, five community boards, mm -hmm. very, very diverse. How do you keep your finger on the pulse of all these areas? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a wonderful staff. Um, I, I couldn't do it alone. 
Uh, and but I, I love the district. I think it is amazing in in its diversity. Uh, you can drive from one end to the other, and you you just you just see how the communities change and how the neighborhoods change. And that's so New York. Mm -hmm. um, people come to this country from all over the world for that very reason. Um, I think about my parents who came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s as young kids, and my mom was in East Harlem, my dad was in the Bronx, and they eventually both wound up there. And uh, how, uh, how the, the wonderment that they felt in New York City. And when I think about my district, I have that same sense of wonderment. Um, and I, I like it like this. I like the fact that it is so challenging. I like the fact that constituents in different parts of the district, and folks on Roosevelt Island have different concerns than folks up in High Bridge mm -hmm. and in, in the, the South Bronx. Um, but because I live in the Bronx, and my office is in East Harlem, and my staff is all over the place, and we have uh, constituent hours on Roosevelt Island, and we just try as much as possible to, to hear the concerns, and the community boards are so important. By going to all of the community board meetings every month, we're able to hear what's going on in each place and talk with constituents. Um, and it is a challenge, but it keeps me on my toes, and I love it. When are your hours in Roosevelt Island? Do you have a, a schedule that's regular? Right. We're, we're there uh, once a month, mm -hmm. um, and you can call my office, which is 212-828-5829, uh, to hear about when we're scheduling hours. But it's the same time uh, every, every month. Um, and my staff is out there in the REAC office. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a state agency, they, they allow us to sit at a desk there. And it's great because we get constituents who do walk in after work, and uh, we make sure that the hours go into the evening. Uh, and we love to hear from folks, and we love to help in any way that we can. Um, my staff, I feel very fortunate, is one of the most dedicated staffs, uh, and they're just wonderful people, and I'm very fortunate to have them. Um, what are your goals for the next um, assembly term? Um, you know, after we we get past the the budget issues, what I mean, what are your longer term goals? Uh, reform issues. Uh, I can't think of anything that's more important to restoring um, the public trust or the, uh, getting the public more motivated in what we do as elected officials, um, in, in, unless we have reform. Um, and that means, uh, I mentioned member item reform, that's just one step. Campaign finance reform, I think, is extremely important um, to help remove the big influences on state government and allow us to be even more accountable to the people. Um, vacancy decontrol reform is a major legislative initiative that time is long, is long past and needs to happen right away. Um, and, and those issues, I think, are, are of critical importance. but. In the short term, dealing with this budget deficit that we're dealing, dealing with the fact that we still don't have a budget 70 days after it was due, um, I think is indicative of the challenges that we're, we're facing. It's indicative of the need for real communication and um, rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. It's a very daunting task. I think this is probably, probably the, the, the most challenging time to be an elected official. Um, but we have to persevere, we have to get through it, and we have to listen to our constituents. Um, and if we do, I think we'll be able to get through it and, and hopefully see brighter days ahead. I understand from your staff one of the, your big missions and big concerns is transparency in government. Could you yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think that the government has, has a right to know, because we are public officials about all the work that we do. And I mentioned member items because mm -hmm. that's been an area that's been so shrouded in mystery. Um, but federal stimulus oversight, as I mentioned earlier, will lift the veil on how uh, these billions of dollars are being spent. Um, one of the things that I find so exciting is that with the uh, introduction and the, the expansion of all these social media outlets like Facebook and Twitter, People, the average constituent, are is uh, is involved in the budget process in ways that they never were before. I mean, let's be honest. The budget process is usually a very boring uh, situation of people going over numbers and and you know flipping through pages and trying to come up with a budget that that is balanced. 
Um, but we have found, and I saw a great example of this this year, that constituents through Facebook and through these medias are, are able to know exactly in real time what is happening in our budget. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you know, I chair the Parks Committee, the State Parks Committee, and when the executive budget came out, there was a provision uh, to close 91 state parks because of budget cuts. Um, I said no way. I, I wanted to work with my elected officials and the constituents um, to, to push back against these cuts, to find the money for restoration. We have to keep our state parks open. But what, was, what really put us over the finish line, because we were able to, to avoid these cuts, was that the public was so motivated and keyed in. I had other elected officials from other parts of the state say, hey, Serrano, you know, I've gotten more emails and letters on the park closure issue than I have on health care and education combined. And I think that that's, that's really a, a great uh, example of, of the public's, uh, public being very keyed in to an otherwise mundane process. Um, so when we talk about transparency, when we talk about public involvement, I think Twitter and Facebook are so important. I have a Facebook page and a Twitter page, and I would constantly put out updates about where we were on these park closures. And folks were listening, and then they were writing in and writing to me and writing to the governor. Everyone got the message. It was great. And um, following up on the parks issue, is the concern on um, the local parks or the state parks where people are vacationing locally? It's both. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, in a recession, uh, staycations, as they're called, mm -hmm. are extremely important. Um, I like to talk about the transformative effect that parks have. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate enough growing up um, as a youngster to be a part of the group camps up in Harriman State Park. Now, if we lost that opportunity, and inner city kids like myself, the next generation, didn't have that opportunity, um, I, I don't even want to think about what would happen to our society. People knew that. Um, so staycations, the, the recreational outlets that they provide, the physical outlets that they provide uh, were so important and folks were keyed in on all of that and they really let their voices be heard. Uh, one uh, area of your district that we didn't mention to, to um, the audience is that you, you encompass also Randall's Island. Right. Um, and uh, can you just speak briefly because we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. How does that impact what you do? Well, Looking at the district map, um, mm -hmm. it, it is it, it does cover you know the river um, and uh, Randall's Island, which uh, no one lives there to my knowledge anyway. Uh, but it is it was tacked onto my district because someone has to represent it, and it's a very interesting place because it is parkland um, and it is a, a a mecca for so many softball leagues and different schools throughout the east side and CBA use. Um, uh, use Randall's Island for their recreational sports and and mm -hmm. uh, we try to work as closely as we can with Commissioner Benepe, uh and uh, and all of the parks advocates to make sure that everyone has access to Randall's Island uh, and that it has not become a place where people are shut out but actually some place where everyone can enjoy. It's a very very exciting park and um, actually accessible by foot Yes. Um, and uh, although the, the bridge is, you know, a little, a little wobbly, but yeah. you know, hopefully you can have that addressed sometime in the future. Yeah. Well, we're, um, we're down to our last minute, but we want to thank you for being on our show. Mm -hmm. um, we look forward to, you know, having you maybe come back in the future. That would be my pleasure. That would be great. And um, seeing you at the community board eight meetings. Yes. So we want to thank everyone for joining us this evening, and thank you, Senator Serrano. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to um, seeing great things for you out of Albany. Thank Thank you. It's a, it was a pleasure being here with you. Thank you. Thank you.